chapter 78. After a half a year's luxurious vagrancy in the islands, I took shipping in a sailing vessel and regretfully returned to San Francisco, a voyage in every way delightful but without an incident, unless lying two weeks in a dead calm eighteen hundred miles from the nearest land may rank as an incident. Schools of whales grew so tame that day after day they played about the ship among the porpoises and the sharks without the least apparent fear of us, and we pelted them with empty bottles for lack of better sport. Twenty-four hours after these bottles would still be lying on the glassy water under our noses, showing that the ship had not moved out of her place in all that time. The calm was absolutely breathless, and the surface of the sea absolutely without a wrinkle. For a whole day and part of a night we lay so close to another ship that had drifted to our vicinity that we carried on conversations with her passengers, introduced each other by name, and became pretty intimately acquainted with people we had never heard of before, and have never heard of since. This was the only vessel we saw during the whole lonely voyage. We had fifteen passengers, and to show how hard-pressed they were at last for occupation and amusement, I will mention that the gentlemen gave a good part of their time every day during the calm to try sitting on an empty champagne bottle lying on its side and thread a needle without touching their heels to the deck or falling over. And the ladies sat in the shade of the mainsail and watched the enterprise with absorbing interest. We were at sea five Sundays, and yet, but for the almanac, we never would have known that. All the other days were Sundays, too. I was home again, in San Francisco, without means and without employment. I tortured my brain for a saving scheme of some kind, and at last a public lecture occurred to me. I sat down and wrote one. In a fever of hopeful anticipation, I showed it to several friends, and but they all shook their heads. They said nobody would come to hear me, and I would make a humiliating failure of it. They said that I'd never spoken in public, and I would break down in the delivery. I was disconsolate now, but at least an editor slapped me on the back and told me to go ahead. He said, take the largest house in town and charge a dollar a ticket. The audacity of the proposition was charming. It seemed fraught with practical worldly wisdom, however. The proprietor of several theaters endorsed the advice and said I might have his handsome new opera house at half price, fifty dollars. In sheer desperation, I took it on credit for sufficient reasons. In three days I did a hundred and fifty dollars worth of printing and advertising and was the most distressed and frightened creature on the Pacific coast. I could not sleep. Who could under such circumstances? For other people there was facetiousness in the last line of my posters, but to me it was plaintive with a pang when I wrote it. Doors open at seven and a half. The trouble will begin at eight. That line has done good service since. Showmen have borrowed it frequently. I have even seen it appended to a newspaper advertisement reminding school pupils in vacation what time next term would begin. As those three days of suspense dragged by, I grew more and more unhappy. I had sold two hundred tickets among my personal friends, but I feared they might not come. My lecture, which had seemed humorous to me at first, grew steadily more and more dreary, till not a vestige of fun seemed left, and I grieved that I could not bring a coffin on the stage and turn the thing into a funeral. I was so panic-stricken, at last, that I went to three old friends, giants in stature, cordial by nature, and stormy-voiced, and said, 
This thing is going to be a failure. The jokes in it are so dim that nobody will ever see them. I would like to have you sit in the parquet and help me through. They said they would. Then I went to the wife of a popular citizen and said that if she was willing to do me a very great kindness, I would be glad if she and her husband would sit prominently in the left-hand stage box where the whole house could see them. I explained that I should need help and would turn toward her and smile as a signal when I had been delivered of an obscure joke, and then I added, Don't wait to investigate, but respond. She promised. Down the street I met a man I had never seen before. He had been drinking and was beaming with smiles and good nature. He said, my name's Sawyer. You don't know me, but that don't matter. I haven't got a cent, but if you knew how bad I wanted to laugh, you'd give me a ticket. Come now, what do you say? Is your laugh hung on a hair trigger? That is, is it critical? Can you get it off easy? My drawling infirmity of speech so affected him that he laughed a specimen or two that struck me as being about the article I wanted. I gave him a ticket and appointed him to sit in the second circle, in the center, and be responsible for that division of the house. I gave him minute instructions about how to detect indistinct jokes, and then went away and left him chuckling placidly over the novelty of the idea. I ate nothing on the last of the three eventful days. I only suffered. I had advertised that on this third day the box office would be open for the sale of reserved seats. I crept down to the theater at four in the afternoon to see if any sales had been made. The ticket seller was gone. The box office was locked up. I had to swallow suddenly or my heart would have gave out. No sales, I said to myself. I might have known it. I thought of suicide pretended illness, flight. I thought of these things in earnest, for I was very miserable and scared. But of course I had to drive them away and prepare to meet my fate. I could not wait for half-past seven. I wanted to face the horror and end it. The feeling of a man, of many a man doomed to hang, no doubt. I went down back streets at six o'clock and entered the theater by the back door stumbled my way in the dark among the ranks of canvas scenery and stood on the stage. The house was gloomy and silent and its emptiness depressing. I went into the dark among the scenes again and for an hour and a half gave myself up to the horrors, wholly unconscious of everything else. Then I heard a murmur. It rose higher and higher and ended in a crash mingled with cheers it made my hair raise it was so close to me and so loud there was a pause and then another presently came a third and before i knew well knew what it was about i was in the middle of the stage staring at a sea of faces bewildered by the fierce glare of the lights and quaking in every limb with a terror that seemed like to take my life away the house was full aisles and all the tumult in my heart and brain and legs continued a full minute before I could gain any command over myself. Then I recognized the charity and the friendliness in the faces before me, and little by little my fright melted away, and I began to talk. Within three or four minutes I was comfortable and even content. My three chief allies, with three auxiliaries, were on hand, all in the parquet, all sitting together all armed with bludgeons and all ready to make an onslaught upon the feeblest joke that might show its head. And whenever a joke did fall, their bludgeons came down and their faces seemed to split from ear to ear. Sawyer, whose hearty countenance was seen looming redly in the center of the second circle, took it up and the house was carried handsomely. Inferior jokes never fared so royally before. Presently I de delivered a bit of serious matter with impressive unction, 
it was my pet and the audience listened with absorbed hush and that gratified me more than any applause and as i dropped the last word of the clause i happened to turn and catch mrs s s intent and waiting eye my conversation with her flashed upon me and in spite of all i could do i smiled she took it for the signal and promptly delivered a mellow laugh that touched off the whole audience and the explosion that followed was a triumph of the evening i thought that that honest man sawyer would choke himself and as for the bludgeons they performed like pile drivers but my poor little morsel of pathos was ruined it was taken in good faith and as an intentional joke and the prize one of the entertainment and i wisely let it go at that all the papers were kind in the morning my appetite returned i had abundance of money and all's well that ends well <laughs> <laughs>